Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday night Bible lecture tonight. Um, tonight, we have Nathan Taylor, who will be speaking to us to the subject, God's Plan for Environmental Restoration. Um, but as this is a Bible talk, we'll open with a word of prayer, if you could all please stand. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your great and holy name. We thank you that we can come here tonight to read and to learn from your word. We see in the world an anxiety about the future of this earth. Nation, um, to introduce his talk tonight, Nathan has asked that we read from Isaiah chapter 35. And I'll ask Tim Penn to come read that for us, after which I'll just ask Nathan to come straight up. Thank you. Reading with you all, Isaiah chapter 35. Once I find it. Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundant, abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be, be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men. Though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Thanks, Timothy, for that reading, and Brad, too, for your introduction. Well, that reading that Timothy just read for us from Isaiah 35 is one of the visions, if you like, given in the Bible of a, a better world to come. We're not going to actually be concentrating on Isaiah 35 tonight, but I thought as a, as a background it was a good reading to, to consider, to see that God does have indeed have a plan for this earth to, to uh, make it a better place than what it is today. Uh, doesn't, you don't need me to tell you that... Um, the environment has been somewhat top of the agenda, maybe only blipped off by a micron at the moment. Um, but it has been, hasn't it, at the forefront of people's minds, particularly with the recent COP26 conference. So it's the 26th conference of the, uh, or the conference of the parties, the 26th time they've got together to sort out the environmental crises of the world. And we know um, that really they didn't achieve what they set out to. And I think the chairman of that conference was actually brought to tears at the end of it because he couldn't achieve what he wanted to in terms of coal. Because it would seem, wouldn't it, that carbon is the, is the enemy of the world at the moment, that carbon is almost, you know, not to be spoken about or, or used or mentioned. 
everything hangs on carbon. We want to look at this subject tonight, not telling you what you already know about the environment, but what the Bible has to say about God's plan for environmental restoration. And it is a subject which is there embedded in the Bible. But when we consider the word environment, it's interesting to see that the word environment can be used in different ways. And, and obviously we know when we're talking about environmental restoration, we are really talking about the restoration of the natural world, of, uh, of the, the nature as we see it, and the removal of some of those problems. But that's not the only way that the word can be used. And in fact, there's two, the first two um, uh, definitions given there on the screen are applicable to this idea tonight, what we're going to be considering, God's plan for environmental restoration. Because the first meaning there given is that it's the aggregate of surrounding things, conditions or influences or their surroundings. And it's got milieu, milieu, which means surroundings. So I don't know why they added that to the end, but just to make it sound fancy. So it's, this says it's the aggregate of surrounding things, so not just the natural world, but, but other things that may, in fact, uh, be there around us in, in our environment that may, that may affect us, the, the people, etc., around us and the social uh, mores of the time. It also then, the second definition is the ecology, the air, water, minerals, organisms, and all other external factors surrounding and affecting a given organism at any time, which I guess is more commonly what we refer to these days in terms of when we're talking about the environment, we're talking about that second definition there, aren't we? The ecology of the world and all of those constituent parts of it and the problems that are perceived to be there in that uh, sphere. But the Bible speaks, when it talks about environmental restoration, you cannot separate, in the scripture, you cannot separate environmental as in ecological restoration, from a moral and a social restoration. You can't do it. Because the Bible puts those parts, if you like, of the environment together. From God's perspective, from a divine perspective, he sees the whole. Not just the, the natural world, but he sees the social and the moral makeup of the world as also being in crisis. And both the moral and the social world needs to be restored, as does the ecological world or the environment, as we would more commonly term it. So there's this linkage between moral and environmental degradation in the scripture. For example, greed and indulgence are probably factors, moral factors, that drive a lot of our environmental concerns today. Greed and indulgence, an overuse of resources, a selfish use of resources, an inequitable distribution of resources. So there's this idea that greed and indulgence, moral characteristics in the world, are contributing to this ecological disaster that we see around us. And this, that linkage is made in the scripture. And also in the scripture, there is a link then between environmental restoration and that moral restoration again, okay? So we've got this tight link between these two ideas contained in the scripture. When we go back to uh, the beginnings of the, of the Bible, back in Genesis chapter 1, we read there that God blessed them. This is to man and woman as he had created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So when God, after the, his creative acts, looked back on the earth, he said his estimation, when he, when he looked upon the earth in its created state, he said it was very good. 
And that statement was about the moral condition of the world as well as the environmental condition of the world. Everything that he had made was very good. It was in harmony and it was in accordance with his plan and his purpose to have this earth reflect his creative genius, his power and his might. But you see there, when God created man and woman on the earth, humankind, he gave them a a great responsibility regarding the natural world which he had created. He gave man and woman dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And those things were given to man or mankind. So the earth, if you like, the world that God had created was placed in the care and custodianship of men and women. And now he might give a report card on how humankind has done with that duty of caring for the world which God created. The first job, in fact, given to man on the earth was to care for the Garden of Eden, part of God's creation. It was a role of tending and keeping, caring for the world which God loved, which he had created, which gave him pleasure. So that was God's intention, wasn't it? To make man to have dominion, or mankind to have dominion over the world, and also to tend and to care for it, this custodianship, this responsibility over the care of the world. But it wasn't very long, was it, in the scriptural record before moral corruption came into the world. We don't yet read of environmental corruption, but moral corruption came in first, didn't it? And we read of that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19. Then Adam said, Because you have heeded to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So the world was very good, and the first thing that happened was man sinned. There was a moral corruption, wasn't there, that was brought into the world. Who was responsible for that? Eve. Eve. And alongside of Eve? Adam. Adam. So the two that God had created and given custodianship of his creation to had failed on the moral front, had they? Hadn't they? And as a result of that, what happens to the environment? what's brought upon the environment as well. There's a curse upon the ground. Who's responsible for that? Adam and Eve. They brought that into the world. Thorns and thistles, if you like, an imbalance in the growth patterns was caused and also death came into the world. So right from the very beginning of the Bible, when when it starts talking about the environment and man's relation to it, starts off very good. God looks at it and it's all very good and he set it up. It's, it's morally good and it's environmentally, ecologically good. It's very sound and in balance. And then comes moral corruption into the world and following that, straight on its heels, comes this beginning of an environmental decay, doesn't it? There's a corruption that is linked between the moral degradation and the environmental corruption or degradation of the world. And as we track through the scripture, you see, when we come to Genesis chapter 6, this is talking about the time of Noah's flood, We read there, the earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. Remember what we read back in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31? What did it say there? It says in Genesis 1 31 that God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. You come to Genesis chapter 6, and what do you read? Now God looks at the earth again after the sin of mankind, and what does he see? It's no longer very good, is it? It's corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Or, in some other translations, I will destroy them that were destroying the earth. 
So God saw the corruption came into the world and he, he saw them clearly, didn't he? He saw this, this moral corruption bringing about an environmental corruption and the moral corruption wasn't waning, was it? The moral corruption kept on increasing and so that when God looked at the world the second time around in Genesis chapter 6 as it's recorded, it's a totally different world to what he had created and the place is corrupt and degraded in his sight. And you go on and read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So you see this moral degradation, don't you? And this is paralleling, it's tracking along with an environmental and ecological degradation. But both these things, both the moral and the social makeup of the world, as long as, along with the ecological makeup, form the environment as God sees it. And these things were being corrupted together, weren't they? And, it, and the, man, the one that was responsible for that was man and his wickedness and the introduction of that corruption into the world. Now, that's not how God wanted it to be. God, God cares for his environment. He, he, he didn't want it to be this way. And in fact, you, you pick up the ideas of God's care for his environment when you go through and, and look through some of the laws and commandments that God had given in the Old Testament for example, in Exodus chapter 23, verse 10 to 11, it says there that six years you shall sow your land and gather in its production, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. So God introduced these ideas, some of which are being adopted again today, which is the idea of you don't try to destroy your land, degrade your land, by using it too, too much. And that's what uh, I guess a lot of the agricultural community is finding out now is that, that man, uh, through their use of the, uh, of the environment or abuse of the environment, have caused a lot of problems with erosion and, and decay of the soil. And here God was establishing ideas back there. He cared for the environment and he said, and not only that, he cared for the poor and, and, and the social makeup of, of the world at that time. But he gave these laws that were, were environmentally sound and that would promote... A, a, a good uh, ecology. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 19 to 20, we read, When you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you can eat them, do not cut them down to use for in the siege, for the tree is of the field is man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. So even when they were going to war, they were commanded that they couldn't go cut down fruit-bearing trees because they were provided for, for the sustenance of mankind. And so what's the point of, of destroying these trees and, and then you leave nothing in the land? So God established these laws. He said, I, I care for the land and I care for the people that live off the land. And I'm going to make some laws here that say when you go out in, into the, into, even into battle, in the heat of the battle, you don't go and you don't start chopping down trees of fruit trees. You leave them. If you need to cut down trees, you cut down wood-bearing trees that don't bear fruit. And you can use them for your siege works, etc. So you see how God was interested in, in the environment, in, in the care for it. And this comes through in the scripture, not that it's a, it's a book of uh, environmental uh, studies, but it, it comes through, doesn't it, that God is interested in the world. He knows how it operates and he had laws and intentions behind it to, to care for this world and for the lives of men that would, would live upon it. So in Deuteronomy chapter 22, he says, If a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself, that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. And I guess for a long time, the, the men have not really followed those rules, have they? And so, you know, now we have catch limits, don't we? In, in the oceans, for example, you can't, you can't catch fish under a certain size because you've got to make sure that you've got the breeding stock there to provide for future generations. And you see how God, in his laws, in the wisdom that he had, in his knowledge of how the ecology worked, he gave laws to Israel right back thousands of years ago to say, look, this is how you treat the environment. This is how you care for it. And you make it so it is sustainable for you and for the generations to come. You look after those things, those fruit trees. You look after the, the, the brood stock that you have that they may be able to uh, bring forth more for the future generations. You don't go and take everything and, and, and ruin the land. 
And you think, well, maybe we should be paying more attention to these uh, matters today, or mankind should be. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10, it says there, a righteous man regards the life of his animal. So he says even, even God even intends for mankind to care for the life of his beast. That's how God intended it to be. You look after them. They are there for your use. And in fact, God ordained that they would be there for man's food as well. But he said, when you're using those animals in your agriculture or in, in your um, herds and flocks, you care for those animals. That's, that's a righteous thing to do. That's right in God's eyes. So this was the sort of framework. This is God's speaking about the environment, if you like, his concern for it and, and the laws that he gave. He was interested in it. He created it very good. Man corrupted it, but still God wanted there to be some protection, some form of protection, even if it was only through his nation of Israel that he had now given his laws to, that they would look after their patch of the world and that they would care for it rightly um, and not exploit it. Unfortunately, they didn't always uh, follow those commands as the Old Testament reveals. So there was God's care for the environment. Now, around the world, we do see a lot of people trying to do the right thing. And, and they see that the world is being destroyed and, and we can't take away really from, from their efforts. Here's one here uh, that is in the, uh, uh, it's in the, uh, what is called the, the great, uh, what is it called? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch, where the currents of the, uh, of the oceans bring together this huge area which is just uh, filled with plastic waste. And so this, uh, this group, the Ocean Cleanup, has started. This is phase two of their program. So they've got these big trawlers that go out with a big net and they scoop up uh, this uh, plastic and then they seek to uh, have, that, have that recycled and they're actually on to phase three. There's a new, new model of this coming out so that they can you know, kill less fish in the process. But you can sort of see that there are people that are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to look after the ecology of the world, but the Bible, as, a, as we said at the start, the Bible says you can't get true environmental restoration unless you also have a moral restoration. You have to change the, the morality of society. You have to change the social structure of society. You've got to get that cleansed and cleaned up before you can solve the problems of the, uh, of the wider world in, in these projects. Now, these are commendable, but they're not, they're not going to end up achieving um, a, an awful lot, a, a, as, at least as far as our understanding of the scripture goes. Interesting article I just saw on the, uh, on the ABC website um, while I was thinking about preparing for this, um, for this talk tonight. And so this is a section that has been taken from a, a Radio National um, Future Tense uh, program. And we can read there... Uh, academic Christopher Barnett from the website explainingthefuture.com describes sustainability as a dangerous concept. It gives the impression that we could all go on living exactly as we live today, but sustainably, with this sort of magic thing wrapped around it, he tells the ABC RN's Future Tense. Sustainable develop, development may be politically convenient, he argues, but it has no real meaning in a world driven by exponential consumption and powered by unlimited extraction. As a physical concept, sustainability is impossible. Life itself is a physically consumptive process. The only way we can actually preserve things for the future and look after the environment is to change how we live to use fewer resources, to value things in another way. See what this man's hinting at? Now, he's, he's by no means speaking it from a biblical point of view, but he's saying this idea of sustainability, it's a myth. The way the world uses that term sustainability these days is a total myth, he says, because you can't expect to go on living as we are now and think we're going to be able to keep doing that because he says we're consuming way more uh, than what is sustainable. We're consuming things, expending things. So he says, his summary is, we need to change how we live. And I would say amen to that, and the Bible would say amen to that. If we want environmental restoration, we need to change how we live. Morally and socially, I would add to that. I don't think the author of this article would go that far. 
he focuses on using fewer resources and, and value things in another way. And while we'd agree with that, I think the changing how we live is what accords with the Bible. We need to change the way people think uh, to make the, the ecology of the world, the environment, a better place. As an example, you think of the, uh, the promotion these days of the electric vehicle. It's being sort of sold as being the answer to this big bad man in the room who's called carbon. So our answer to that is we go and buy electric vehicles. See, so we're not really changing the way we live, are we? We're just using different fuel to power the way we live. So we can still do exactly what we want, when we want, but does that, uh, what are they called? Um, Tesla. D does that Tesla look to you like a sustainable item? It looks like it's a consumptive item to me. So in the article in the middle, which is taken from Forbes, it says electric vehicles are driving demand for lithium with environmental consequences. So we've got to have batteries for these vehicles, don't we? So you're going to go and buy your new Tesla or your power wall to put on your, home, uh, on your wall at home. That's great, but you've got, to get, you've got to consume products to do that, don't you? So you're going to go and get lithium to make these batteries of today. And so what happens with the, with the lithium production, so about a quarter of the world's lithium comes out of Chile in the Atacama Desert. And the Atacama Desert, as you might, uh, might be inferred by its name, is a pretty dry place. But what is all the water up there being used for? for the production of lithium. And so the environment in that area and, and the, the native peoples of that area and all the native flora and fauna is suffering in the Atacama Desert because all of this water is being used to produce sustainable cars. So it's not really sustainable, is it? So I think this is the point. Is you, you see, you can't go on living as we live. You can't expect to be consuming and, and doing what we do and keep that in balance. It's, it's not going to work that way. If you've got... Can't recycle it. Okay, there you go. So we've got, we've got problems. So we're not really answering the problems, are we? We're just kicking the can down the road, in a sense. We're saying carbon's a problem, so we'll get rid of carbon, we'll, we'll, we'll make batteries, okay? And we'll have our solar farms out there and these beautiful windmills, they, they enhance the environment, don't they? Out there, you know, you're driving up to Port Augusta now, and you can see them. Oh, aren't they, aren't they gorgeous? They look just stunning in the environment, don't they? And you can drive past them all, and, and they're going to power your Tesla, um, and that's sustainability. That's environmentally sustainable. They're still and they're still burning coal, exactly. Well, they're burning, they burn coal to make the steel to put around, wrap around the Tesla so they can put the lithium inside of it, yeah, and then the rubber that goes on. Yeah. And what happens to the rubber top? Anyway, we could go on, couldn't we? So all of these things, are, they're not really sustainable, are they? So we can see that and, and we have to admit that to ourselves. So we can't expect to go on living as we do. Remember what that other slide says? It says we have to change the way we live. And that, I think, is the big challenge. Is because men don't want to change the way they live. Or well, they do, they want to change it for the better. They want to have a faster car that can go further and cost them less. But they don't want to not have a car. They don't want to have to go back to walking or riding a horse, which may be somewhat sustainable. We don't want to do that. So we can see we're in a bit of a, uh, a quandary, aren't we, as to how we proceed. I've, I've witnessed some sustainable living, and I don't know that we'd all want to jump in there um, straight away. So it might change, take a little bit of a change of our thinking, of our mindset to be able to experience or, or to take on board sustainable living. This is what I would see as sustainable living. This is uh, some of my friends up in Vanuatu, which I've been there before. I know some others here have been up to places like uh, uh, up in Bougainville and, and Papua New Guinea. Uh, maybe some others to the Solomon Islands. These, these places, they know how, how to live sustainably, at least uh, in large part, Ex exclude the uh, concrete slab there because uh, that's not really sustainable. That's got a lot of carbon in it, so that's not very good. Sorry, Garen, but I had to give you a cross for that one. But there's, there's some sustainable living, isn't there? Using the natural resources of the world. And, and uh, here's a young man using that, built without any, uh, any nails or anything else like that, using the bindings made stripped from trees, uh, wrapping around those cane fronds and, and rebuilding his house. That's actually after a cyclone had gone through and destroyed his other one. Um, living off the land, growing your own produce and not, not heading down to the supermarket and buying your nice organic plastic wrapped uh, mushrooms or whatever it might, might be. I don't suppose you have plastic wrapped mushrooms, do you? They, they go in a nice paper bag. Um, but th this is a different way of living, isn't it? 
this is, this is what sustainability is, if you like, um, at, at least as I see it, um, and that's pretty good sustainability, that. At least I like the, the bundle on the back. The ones on the front, the bananas, they're not so, so crash hot, but the fish are good as long as you eat them on the first day. Or, or do you, using the, the, the weaving the mats, you know, this is, this is handcraft, isn't it? But it's, but it's a totally different way of life, isn't it? This isn't buying stuff that's been produced in some factory over in Bangladesh or something like that by some person that's underpaid and being exploited and then shipped across the, the other side of the world. This is using the natural environment to provide for you and your family in a sustainable way, but uh, is the world really ready to take this on? Or if you want to carry your water up the hill, well then exclude the, uh, the black plastic uh, one on the uh, left hand and look at the bamboo canes on the right hand because in fact they've got holes not through and they're actually carrying water inside of those bamboo canes. So this is, anyway. I'm off on a tangent, aren't I? But this is what we have as sustainable living, isn't it? This is using the environment in a sustainable way. Uh, when we go to sustainable and start using bamboo, well, our bamboo comes out of a factory, doesn't it? And that's chuffing carbon into the atmosphere, etc., etc. Off I go on another tangent. But anyway, you, you see where we're getting at. To, to, to make the world a sustainable place, the world has to change, and, and our expectations, the way we live, has to change. And along with that, we need to change morally, get rid of a lot of the greed and the wants that we have and live in accordance with the way that God would have his creation lived in. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and who made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. God that created this world has formed it and he said it is going to be inhabited. So what we don't have to worry about is we don't have to worry about environmental total destruction of the world because God said he won't allow that to happen. He has created this world for it to be inhabited. He's going to maintain it as a habitable space for mankind. So we don't have to jump on that rocket that's heading off to Mars. We're quite safe here in the world. There is a better future than taking that risk. And that is with God taking uh, care of things. He is going to maintain the inhabitability of the world despite what man might do to it. Now, man, in all of his efforts to, to solve the problems of the world, will not get there. The guy in the Bible is clear of that. It says, Oh, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Man can't, and has probably proven this throughout the ages of history, he can't get it right. He was given custodianship of the world, stewardship of the world, to look after this world that God has created, to care for it. And how has he done so far? Have things improved? Has, has education improved the sustainability of the world? So we take the most educated societies, are they the most sustainable societies? They're not, are they? So, so you would think, Surely, if it was in man to direct his steps, then the more knowledge and education and wisdom that man got, and, and men do know a lot, don't they? They've, they know a lot about the environment. But yet they corrupt it. Yet they destroy it. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps, God says in summary. Rather, this is the advice of Jesus Christ. He says, don't wait for men to fix things up. It's not going to happen. As good as their intentions may be, he says... After this manner, pray ye, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, God, to, inhabit this, to have this world inhabited, to have it morally restored, ecologically restored. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Christ says, if we're worried about the way things are going in the world, and we should be, he says the answer to that is prayer for God to solve the problem. It's not in man to do that. God will solve that, and he declares in his Bible, in the scriptures which we have read from, that it is through the coming kingdom that God will establish upon the earth that this will be achieved. And that kingdom, rather relying on, on all of these countries gathering together to, to hold uh, COP26 or, or any other COP that might come along, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one, and his name one. So rather than having multiple governments looking after their own interests and their own economies ahead of the environment, 
looking to the next election, whatever else it might be. Part of this solution is for there to be a singular world government that can do things equitably across the world. Not one country exploiting the resources of another or taking other people for granted, but rather a sharing through the, uh, through the instrument of a common world government. Not established by man, but established by the Lord. One of the chapters that speaks a lot about this <clears throat> is Psalm 72. So Psalm 72 is a psalm written by David which talks about a future king to come and a future kingdom. And this psalm relates to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, to his return for which he told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth. Christ taught us to pray for this kingdom and that kingdom is written about in Psalm 72. And there Christ is portrayed as the king who is coming and what he will accomplish upon the earth. It says of that king in Psalm 72, verses 8 and 11, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. So there's one king shall be king to them all. That's what we read in Zechariah. And this king is going to have dominion from sea to sea, across the whole earth, from the river to the ends of the earth. Yes, and all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So one king that is king to all the world, ruler of the, of the whole world. And what will be some of the results of that? Uh, so Psalm 72 goes on and says, what he's going to do when he comes is he's going to bring justice to the poor of the people. He's going to save the children of the needy. He's going to break in pieces the oppressor. In his days, the righteous shall flourish and there's going to be an abundance of peace until the moon is no more. For he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and the needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. So you see, when this kingdom comes, you see, the work of the king is to have a social reform in the world, isn't it? Part of the environment is made up of those social elements, isn't it? So here you see how this king coming is going to bring about these blessings upon the earth that he will bring this, this salvation for the oppressed, for the neglected, for the poor. So there's that, that's what the king is intending to do. He's going to change society and he's going to make society live in a different way. It says in another passage, it says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, as part of that, it says, he will destroy those who destroy the earth. So in Psalm 72, it speaks about him breaking in pieces the oppressor. In Revelation 11, verse 18, it says he's going to destroy those that destroy the earth. And if we track that language back, remember what it said right back in Genesis chapter 6, the ways of man, they were corrupting the earth, weren't they? And God was going to destroy them with the earth because they were corrupting it back then. It goes right through to Revelation, the other end of the Bible. God's still the same principle is if, if you corrupt, if you destroy my earth, then you will be destroyed by the coming of my king. So there we have it. Is this, this change is going to be brought about through force. And when we talk about this destroying those who destroy the earth, we aren't just talking about people who destroy the earth in an ecological sense, but also in a moral, in a social sense as well. So if we return back to Psalm 72, so the king is coming, he's going to bring peace and righteousness, he's going to care for the poor and the needy, he's going to break in pieces the oppressor or destroy those that destroy the earth. Linked to that, linked to that moral and social change in the world, there is also environmental change being spoken of in that same kingdom. Psalm 72, verse 6 to 8. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. A refreshing and a replenishing of the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and an abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And sorry, I think I was meant to have another verse in there, which was... My apologies. So if we go to Psalm 72. A good psalm to read on this topic, along with Isaiah uh, 35. So you take Isaiah 35 as a note to, to, to take back home and, and have a read of that. And, and Psalm 72 alongside of that, which speaks not only of the environmental change, but that social and moral reform. Because it speaks in Psalm 72 in verse 16, it says, 
And there shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. There's a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. Well, you think, well, that's not a great thing, is it, if you've only got a handful of corn on top of the earth? But that's not really what it means here. What what it's speaking about is typically on the top of the mountains, it's the least fertile part, isn't it? The soil is washed down, so up on the top of the mountains, you're not going to have much depth of soil, and therefore, typically, your crops will not grow to such an extent. But in this day, if you went up there, a little bit like the picture from Isaiah 35, you went go up into the top of the mountains in those days, into the, if you like, the least fertile parts of the earth, and you went, went hold of a, a stalk of wheat and you ran your hand up there, then when you took off that head of all those, all those kernels at the end there, you would have a handful. Not just one or two seeds, but a handful of them, off each of those plants that were growing in what otherwise would have been a... A less fertile part of the earth. So here in this, this psalm, which is speaking about this, this coming of the king, God's kingdom being established upon the earth, righteousness and peace coming, care for the poor and the needy, a social reform. It also speaks about there being righteousness there, so a moral reform, and also an ecological reform or restoration here being spoken of in Psalm 72 and verse 16. So in Isaiah 65, another passage which is is on a similar train of thought, we read there. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now this isn't literally meaning that God is going to create a new globe upon which things are going to be had. It says he's going to so rejuvenate the world that it's going to be like a new place. He's going to clear off all of the dross, all of the corruption that man has brought upon the earth and he's going to create it like it's new. New heavens and a new earth. In fact, speaking in symbolic terms of a change of of government above and those that are living on the earth. And this is going to be a complete change of the world, he says. Now, remember what we said about sustainability, how it needs a change in how we live. And that's not necessarily what we're all going to jump at uh, uh, living in our developed Western world with all the comforts that we have. We're not going to say, well, I want to give up my car. I want to give up my air-conditioned house. I I want to give up my fridge and microwave. I want to get rid of uh, these these nice clothes that I can buy uh, fairly cheap, um, you know, that's all made by someone else. This speaks, in the scripture, it speaks about this time of the kingdom as there being a, a change to the way that people will live, a radical change for the earth's mortal population. It says there in verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall the days be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. So when Christ establishes God's kingdom upon the earth, which he has told us to pray for, you see how he is going to change the way things are done. We don't go and write a contract for someone else to build our house for us. No, we go and build it ourselves. A little bit like my friend over in Vanuatu, Garen, building his house out of bamboo, or that young boy that lived down on the island of Tanna, building it out of cane, building it for ourselves. And I wonder what happens to the size of houses when you build them yourself. I suggest they probably won't take you three weeks to clean them. They will build houses and inhabit. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. So they're going to be living off the land, aren't they? Sustainably off the land, off the fruit that they plant and they harvest. So what happens to wastage? What happens to transport costs? What happens to global shipping? What happens to the trucks going up and down the roads or the roads to carry those trucks? What happens to the supermarkets and the refrigeration that's in the supermarkets and the wind turbines to drive those refrigerators that are in the supermarkets? Those things are no longer required, are they? Because what is this talking about? This is talking about a more sustainable world, isn't it? This is talking about the world as God intended it to be lived in. He creates things for man's use, not abuse, He creates sufficient for man's need, not their greed. But he says, it's not like it's going to be a hardship. See at the end of that verse, it says, and 
my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. There's a satisfaction, isn't there? In going out there, in, in creating something, in eating the fruit of your own garden, in living in the house that you have built, there's a satisfaction. And might we say that probably relieves a lot of the, uh, of the stresses that we have in our society now. We probably hear a little bit about green space and blue space now. You heard those terms being used about how we need to get into, out, out for our mental health, we need to get out into green spaces or into blue spaces and these things actually improve our, our mental health. This is what the research is telling people. We need to be in the natural environment and it improves our mental health. Amazing, isn't it? This is what God intends. He says, I want to change the world. I want to change the way you live. But it's not going to, it's not going to be a burden for people it is in fact going to mean that people upon the earth in that day can long enjoy the work of their hands. And so in Micah 4, verse 3 and 4, there's another passage that relates to this and it says, Many nations shall come and say in that day, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion the law shall go forth and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So what's happening here in Micah 4? Talking about the same time. Now, this is talking about a, a, a moral reform linked to a religious reform, isn't it? That people are no longer going to ignore the ways of God or his morality. They're not going to say, well, that doesn't actually fit with my uh, 21st century way of thinking. That doesn't hit, fit with my tolerance. So I'm not going to listen to the laws and commandments of God. No, no, people are going to listen to the commands of God. They're going to go up. They're going to want to be taught those ways. So this is, this is a religious reform that brings about a moral change, doesn't it? a moral change and to get rid of that greed and, and inequity and the exploitation of others and, and the abuse of the environment, etc., etc. All these things are changing as people come to hear God's way of thinking, God's way of acting and are educated therein in God's morality. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke the strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Well, this is a bit like reuse, reduce, recycle, isn't it? This is a bit of the recycle bit, isn't it, here? So we take those instruments of war and they are converted instead into instruments of agriculture. A nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So take all of that effort and time and, and resources and, and, and men's hours they put into making weapons of destruction and turn them into, into implements for agriculture and use them in a useful way that people can live off their own vineyard, as it were, plant their own gardens and live from them and have these resources available to them. So, in fact, the idea of recycling things is there uh, embedded in the scripture. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. This is a great picture, isn't it? Every man sitting under his vine and under his fig tree. So there he is, he's, he's sat down in his garden... With those things that he's growing around him, he's not sitting inside his house with locked doors and security cameras and a finger on the button ready to call for emergency services. No one's going to make them afraid. A complete moral change to society. So you see, the corruption that was brought about right back in Genesis that man brought about because of let, letting go of the ways and the morality of God and bringing environmental destruction upon the world, environmental uh, uh, decay upon the world is going to be reversed, isn't it? And as we establish God's laws and God's morality in the world, then these problems, like these social problems that we have in the world today, are also going to be gone. So the whole environment, not just the trees and the flowers, not just the, the clean oceans, not just the, the pure water running down the rivers, but pure hearts and and loving people around us. This is the environment which God seeks to have restored upon the earth. For all the people will walk in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So there's that change, isn't it? Change here, this religious change, bringing about a moral change, and that linking in with a social change and, and with that the ecological change and all of these things making up the environment of the world in which we live and people will long enjoy the work of their hands. This is how the Bible portrays this, this environmental renewal of the earth in those days. Uh, there was my quote that I lost before. Um, it slipped down. 
Interestingly, the scripture doesn't actually say exactly how this is going to come about, but, but there's an interesting allusion to the way in which the, the, the clean-up will occur. And I don't think all of this is going to be done through the work of, of uh, mankind because I, I don't think we, um, we necessarily will have all of, the, uh, all of the abilities to necessarily do that. But you see here in Ezekiel 39, this is a picture that's painted after, if you like, World War III, after, after the the Battle of Armageddon, which occurs in and around Jerusalem. It speaks in Ezekiel 39 of the clean-up, if you like, of that area around Israel after the Battle of Armageddon. And this is just, just intriguing to me anyway. It says there in Ezekiel 39 of the, of the uh, oppressors that are, that are then destroyed by the coming of Christ. It says there, You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I'll give you to the birds of prey of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Okay, maybe not particularly choice um, things to be reading about, but that's the reality, isn't it? Those, those things being, instead of being uh, them destroying God's creation, God's creation, in fact, feasting on them. Then those who dwell on the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelin and the spears, and they will make fire of them, with them for seven years. So instead of going out and cutting down trees, as it says, they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any tree from the forests because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who have pillaged them. So here's an idea, isn't it, of part of this clean-up of the, of, or the area around the nation of Israel, at least. It says that people are going to go out and they're going to be gathering up this, this, uh, the, the remnants of, of the war that has happened there and they are going to be using those as a, as a resource. Again, reuse, reduce, recycle. And again, it goes on in Ezekiel 39. It says... It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place in the land of Israel in the valley of those who pass by the East Sea and it will obstruct travellers because there they will bury Gog and all his multitude. Therefore they will call it the valley of Haman Gog. Gog is the name title given to the oppressor that comes, leads the armies against the nation of Israel before Christ intervenes as king. For seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, the people of the land will be burying and they will gain renown for it of the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. And they will set apart men regularly employed, the help of the search party to pass through the land and to bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search and the search party will pass through the land. And when anyone sees a man's bone, he shall set up a marker by it till the, till the buriers have buried it in the valley of Haman Gog. The name... Of the, of the city will be called Hamona. Thus they shall cleanse the land. See, God wants his land cleansed, doesn't he? And there he's speaking about physical things, isn't he? He's speaking about picking up the carcasses and the remnants of those carcasses and cleansing that land and making it, making it a beautiful place. But just interesting, I thought, that the way that their God uses, he's going to use uh, mankind in that process, isn't he, as part of that process of cleaning and cleansing his land. And you get the idea of cleansing there, and that, that's a word that's used in the scripture, isn't it? Not only of physical cleansing to clean something from its, from its dirt and debris, but a moral cleansing, a cleansing of people's hearts. And that is what God is going to be doing throughout the whole world, to cleanse the world and to change it. But it does imply in the scripture, therefore, that that uh, men will be involved in, in that process. In Revelation chapter 21, we read there, right at the end of the Bible, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Well, that's quite a change, isn't it? No more death, sorrow or crying. There shall be no more pain. Those former things have passed away. So in God's restoration, he reverses it right back to where it was right at the beginning when he created it, before death and sorrow entered the world as a result of sin, before crying came because of that, because before pain entered the world, before the thorns and thistles came to inhabit the world, because God has brought the world back to how he intended it at the beginning, restoring it to, to its created form and better. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. 
So God is going to make all things new. That's his plan for environmental restoration, to, to cleanse this world and to re-establish, to make everything new, if you like, to a new and a beautiful place that reflects his praise and his glory and is how he wants it, making all things new. So Christ says to us, doesn't he? He says to his disciples, he says, you've got to pray for that time. It's a good time to come. Well, I'd like to thank um, Nathan on behalf of everyone here for a very interesting talk um, and very informative about a topic that seems to be talked about all around us in the world. And if anyone has any questions about what's been spoken about tonight, then please come and speak to Nathan or talk to any of the Christadelphians here. I'm sure everyone will be more than happy to discuss uh, the things we've talked about tonight. Uh, we would also invite everyone to come back next week, um, back at the, here at the hall again at 6pm, um, God willing. We'll have another talk, uh, which will be by Jimmy Fitness, to the topic, Palestine, whose land is it? Uh, which is another very, very big question in the world today. Um, we would also invite everyone to please stay back for a light supper, which will be served after we close in prayer. Uh, which we'll do now, if you could all please stand. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had tonight to consider the world that you created and how it was morally and environmentally corrupted by the actions of men. But we also learnt of your wonderful plan to restore this world, to bring about religious moral, social, and environmental changes for good. We pray that your will, Father, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your kingdom to come to this earth, where your Son shall reign righteously over the whole earth. We also pray that we may meet again next week, if it is your will, to keep learning more from your word. We also thank you for the supper which we have to eat, for we know that many go without food. So please help us to always remember how blessed we are by you. We thank you especially for your son. We pray for his soon return back to this earth. And it is through him, our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.